Father, bless your word. Let your will be done. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this hour. I thank you that I don't know what you're doing in this earth, God, but you're doing something. We give you all the honor and the glory. And we pray that somebody's life will be changed today. All those in agreement said amen. The question is, why do we find ourselves holding on and resisting letting go toxic relationships? Now, as a pastor, it is no, it is no, I don't, as a pastor, I've had to experience this more occasions, more occasions than I can ever remember. And, you know, I, I, I'm almost positive God allowed me to pastor so that I can get healed. Uh, he used the parishioners to heal me. He says, why do you, so I said, why do you find yourself holding on and resisting and, and resisting letting go toxic relationships? Let me, let me make that even a more general statement. The question I, I have to ask myself, I know this relationship is no good for me. I know it's not right for me, but yet I persist on staying in that relationship. Anybody ever been there? yet I persist on being in that relationship. What is my problem? What has happened? Why am I in a relationship that is so toxic to my spirit that it crushes me? Well, what I came to understand is it's the Stockholm Syndrome. And the Stockholm Syndrome comes from uh, it's a deep inexcusable bond with someone who has hurt you. The Stockholm Syndrome was originally coined with some bank robbers who had robbed a bank, and the people who were the victims, say victims, began to have affection for the robbers, and before long, they, the victims, protected the victimizers, which were the robbers. And they realized, because the robbers had treated them with such contempt at one point, and then treated them with love, and they, they took the robber's point of view and they even set up a defense for, a form, fund for them. There's another later example of the Stockholm Syndrome, which is Patty Hearst. Some of you may be too old to remember who Patty Hearst is. If you do remember, just be quiet. Uh, but Patty Hearst was a rich white girl who had been kidnapped uh, by revolutionaries and before long, she used the Stockholm Syndrome and she became a part of the captors and she started robbing banks with them and doing some illicit uh, crimes with them. And when they went to, or when they finally caught the guys, her defense was the Stockholm Syndrome, that she had psychologically fallen in love with her victimizer and she got off. And so compassion, this is, so the Stockholm Syndrome is when you have compassion and loyalty to those who abuse you. You are compassionate to those who misuse you. And so the hostage becomes the champion, and the hostage taker or the person who molested you or whatever, you learn how to take up their cause. Now, what makes this syndrome so binding, I found, is that the relationship is so intense between the victim and the victimizer. It's the intensity of that relationship. And once that intensity breaks, even if it could have been some bad energy or misdirected energy, you still feel empty. So you don't feel right unless you're connected to the chaos. Yeah, I got it. So in between, so what happens is you can be in a relationship, get out of it, and you can let a period of time go by and then you can get back into that relationship because you think time made that relationship heal itself, but time didn't do that. It was a period. It was a period uh, between the abuse and the last time the abuse occur, occurred. And so we think time heals it. So I told people that trust and loyalty must be earned. And Jesus said in Matthew 12, 28, who is my family? And he stretched out his hands towards people. And he says, he says, my mother, he says, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who are my brothers? 
stretching out his hands towards them, he said, my mother, my brothers, he said, here are my mothers and brothers, whoever does the will of my father is in heaven. My, bro my father in heaven is my brother and sister and my mother. So loyalty that, loyalty to that which does not work or worse, to a person who is toxic, uh, exploitive and destructive to you is a form of insanity. So what I found out is that I had, I, and we'll deal with this as we keep going, somewhere in my training I had learned, and somewhere in our training we have learned to be loyal to those who exploit or are very destructive to us. And that's insanity because this is not who God has created you. When I say destructive, I mean verbally, whatever it is, we've learned to be loyal to that. Y'all with me, right? You with me in Atlantic and in Maryland, Cabby? Okay, so now, I gave you several signs to let you know that you are in, you are bonding with your victimizer. You are bonding with those people who betray you. And I said that you have constant repetitive fights, destructive fights. You can plainly, you, you, others can see what you're plainly, plainly explaining away. What was done to you, you can't feel it or see it. These people constantly or consistently demonstrate a non-performance attitude. They don't show up and do the things they have to do and they feel fill the air with false promises. You are bound when you are hell bent on proving to them and those who they told the, told about your situation to, you, you're hell bent on proving to them that you are not who they think you are. Does that ring a bell? Have you ever found yourself trying to talk to other people saying, what you heard is not the whole story and you're trying to tell the story? And so you remain loyal to a person, you hold on to their secrets. So the question becomes, why do I, why, why do they do this? Why did he or she do this to me? I just can't understand what just happened. I found myself fixated trying to figure out what did I do to deserve this? Because you are trying, you know that you have given your best. But then you're asking yourself, this could be in your family, this can be your son, this could be your daughter, your grandmother, father, sister, brother, all relationships. What did I do to have this person or this group of people treat me in such a way? What made my uncle, what made my aunt, what made them do this? Well, I found that I would fixate on that. And so if you fixate on that, you're looking for reasons as to why they did what they did. And so I said, trying to understand why you've been stabbed in the heart and betrayed is useless. Because if you try, and, and the reason I say it, because why doesn't matter. What is, is. And even if you knew why, how does that help me? But because we have, no one, is that, no one ever sat down with me to talk with me, to tell me what I'm telling you. And most, 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 probably no one ever sat down with you to tell you this is what's been going on with you along a whole, a, a, a large portion of your life. And so this is your reality now. This is where we must practice acceptance and just let go of the reasons why. You have to practice, I accept that this, I got betrayed. This is my reality now. Say this is my reality now. Now let's look at this. When I say betrayed, I'm saying, you know, this is, you spoke to someone in confidence. Now five people know what's going on. This is somebody that, you know, you, you adore. They have great, y'all got a great relationship but then they just do the most crazy off the wall thing and you and, and you know it because you'd be like, I thought we were, how could, how could you not answer my call? How could you walk off from me like this? Am I in the right place? Do 
Do I have any brothers and sisters? So it's, it's not why you need to know. You need to know what and who. What's going on and who you're dealing with. Why does it matter? Well, what does? And so we are in the age of lust. This is the age of the generation of non-commitment. This has been an age of generation of non-commitment that we've been in for at least the last 15 to 20 years, but it's been longer than that, but when it says there'll be terrible times in the last days, even non-believers are looking at the news saying we are in the last what? Days. So non-believers, atheists are even saying, I don't believe in God, but the earth getting ready to end because it's just too much going on. Well, it's been cranked up with social media and everything. This is the coward generation. And the coward generation, we don't confront, we don't deal, we don't talk about anything. And this is a generation where you can type something out anonymously and tear somebody's life apart and never have to suffer any consequences for it. Am I correct? So this is the, this is, I had somebody say, a teacher tell me, she says, the kids don't go together. They don't have committed relationships. It's all a hookup. And so the hookup means we do not have accountability with one another. It's what you say it is. You know, they have successfully turned the word wife into wifey. And so a woman is not even expected. I know my, my, my wife said, based upon the things she saw with the men that grew up in her life, she, they, she expected men to cheat. She expected people not to be loyal because that's just the way the world has been. And since social media, the inundation of technology and the speed of it and chat this and text that and Vine this and new thing that, new thing this and Instagram that and this room and this. And so everybody's talking, but nobody's listening. So what is really happening? The scripture tells us in Matthew 24. The scripture says, and many will be offended, repelled and repelled and will begin to distrust and desert him who they ought to trust and obey and will stumble and fall away and betray one another and pursue one another with hatred. So in the beginning of that, Matthew, he tells us there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, storms, earthquakes, famines, you name it. He said those are going to be the beginning. He said then and then many, there are going to be many people who had relationship who are now going to be offended and repelled and will begin to distrust other people and desert him, meaning the God who created them for their own pleasure, their own purposes. Will begin to desert them and betray one another and then it says betray and pursue one another with hatred, meaning someone who betrays you, can it can turn into hate. I don't know if you've ever had a right relationship where you don't know how did this happen. We were so close. I guess it's only people in Maryland that experience this. Just wave your hand if I'm making any sense to y'all. Okay, great. And so you say, how did this happen? We were so close. I don't know if you've ever been horrified by the distance between somebody you were so close to. And sometimes you'd be like, all I said was, or I brought to the attention or whatever it is, and we're going to show you why, what happened. Well, it says that they will pursue with hatred, meaning before long, they'll be coming after you. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many into error. So now this is saying... In this season, the word of God will be so, so watered down that men of God who are not men of God but men of church and religion 
people will sit in their churches and be able to carry out this type of betrayal and nobody will say anything about it. It is betrayal that tears churches apart. And so it says, and then the love of the great body of people will grow cold. King James says, wax cold. So it says that people who love is warm, love is hot, is warm, love has heat to it. And it says they will no longer have a warmth or desire for their brother, their sister, their whoever they were in relationship with but it will wax cold and they will not, they'll be non-caring. But why are they non-caring? They're non-caring the same way many of us ended locked up in prison, in jail, going through certain things. What is really happening? Because it will, be, the, will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. So lawlessness makes love grow cold. If you live in a neighborhood where there's no law, if you grow up in a family where anything goes and nobody says anything about what goes and you're just a child in that environment, then you become lawless and then iniquity, wickedness, all the different things that happen will cause your heart to wax cold. But it says, but he or she who endures to the end will be saved. My problem was, and I don't know if you're anything like me, I said to myself, there's sometimes you didn't experience pain where you say, I'll never be there again, and then find yourself there again, and then you'll be like, I can't believe. And this is when you start saying, me. You have you ever had somebody say, they got me? I mean, I understand I'm getting them, but they got who? Me, because you pride yourself in knowing that, wait a minute. You know what you're saying, but I'm going to show you something because we don't want to demonize the psychopath and the sociopath. They have a soul. Although they act like a demon, they got a soul. But there's something going on with their soul. They have put up a wall of protection. And so they have decided that my life will be met through my, my spiritual life and my fulfillment will be met through my relationships, which means, say this, they need me to feel fulfilled. Say so they need stuff to feel fulfilled. And they have walled themselves in and protected themselves. So when a person is a betrayer, they seek their benefit or protection at your expense. They seek their benefit or your protect or their protection. I mean, they seek their benefit and or protection at your expense. So when you are betrayed by someone, this is why I feel so messed up to be betrayed by someone because it's the ultimate abandonment of the covenant. A covenant you have with somebody. That's why you feel so torn and messed up when a relationship breaks off because what's breaking is that unseen covenant that held y'all together. And so, and I'm talking about friendship. Listen, you have a covenant with your mother as a child. A mother should have a covenant with her, her, her child as a mother. A father should have a covenant with his family and vice versa. Y'all got that, right? A brother and sister, we are to have covenants with each other. And when that covenant is broken, it hurts so bad, it feels like hatred. Priming, I don't know if this will work. Got on the plane and left my phone in the security. So when I went to make the call, I realized I can't let them know I'm on the plane, can't let nobody I'm arriving, can't let anybody know. And you feel naked. What am I going to do? I don't even think I have any quarters. I don't even know if they got pay phones. And it's too early in the morning. I don't feel like asking somebody to use their phone because I don't feel like the rejection at 7 o'clock in the morning. So I'll just wait till I land. And I'll just go get me a burner. Why do you do that drug? I'll go get me 
um, track foam. And what I will do is use that. And I also said on the plane, I said, and I'm not going to get upset. It's going to be a security. And if it ain't, it just ain't. But I'm going to teach this message today. I'm not going to be disturbed. But it came back. After about 15 minutes, that only worked for like 15 minutes. Then you start thinking about what you got on your phone. And I'm glad I ain't got no sex tapes or uh, sexting or anything like that. I'd be in trouble. But I said, man, and I said, D, you said you ain't going to worry about that. If I'm feeling like that over a phone, you ever lost your purse, your wallet, your ID? You know I got to go through so much to get that back. Got to go to the DMV. I got to get this done. I got to stop my credit cards. I got to do this. Well, let's now switch over to being betrayed. When somebody betrays you, it's so many different nuances and idiosyncrasies in that relationship that you realize, you don't, you begin, you realize, like if you ever lost your wallet, you think all I had in there was such and such and such. And then later you remember like, oh my goodness, I left that check in there. Then the panic is on again, right? When you get betrayed, that thing just keeps coming back to you because you have had a covenant relationship with somebody. And you can't believe that they broke that ultimate covenant. And so the people who betray, they give in to what most of us must fight. And I go down to the bottom and it says, we'll be offended. Scandalon is the Greek word for the word offense. And it and scandalon means bait. And so they the the, the, the the ancients they said offense looks like you going to take food off of a trap, but the but the, the bait is put on the trap and the snare so that when you touch it, that trap grabs you. When you get offended, you are going after some bait, you are going after that trap. And that thing grabs you, that relation grabs you, and before long, you're offended. And so what you end up with is a lifetime of bitterness, resentment, resentment, unforgiveness, and hatred. And so many of us felt, we, we fail to understand, we have a spirit of offense. A spirit of what? And what is a spirit of offense? A spirit of offense is when you have constantly allowed yourself to be baited in to be baited in in such a way where you are trapped by, you are trapped by this spirit that makes you constantly bitter because your spirit has been offended. Say snapped. I want to submit to you this morning, the betrayer, the betrayer has snapped. And they decided that I'm going to use people. They decided that I'm going to get what I need to get. And so a spirit of offense is the scripture says Proverbs 18 19 and it says a brother of a brother a brother offended is harder to win than that of a strong city and the contentions are like the bars of a castle and so it says when a brother or a sister is offended they're like a, 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 a strong city now I'm gonna challenge you because the things I'm sharing for you I'm laying the foundation to get you to understand why you're having panic attacks, why you are shut down, why you, why you can't seem to get out of a toxic relationship, why you get into a toxic relationship. Because people who have been, people who betray have been offended. Say this, people, have been be, people who betray have been, been offended at some point in their life early on. So just let, let's look at the life of what does it mean that they've been offended. They've had to take offense from being offended from family members. They've had to give offense. I can give, I can take it as well as I can give it. They've been offended by the truth. They've been offended because if somebody speaks truth to them, they were offended that somebody disrupted them. They're offended at God and they're offended with the Holy Spirit. They even offend themselves because they can't understand why they do what they do. And so 
and they do all of this, and I put smiley faces up there, they do all of this with a mask on, they do all of this with, with different uh, cotton, uh, disguises, and for all intents and purposes, the betrayer is a chameleon. They have had to learn to blend in to whatever environment they're with. So what does that mean for you and I that when we get into a relationship with a person who's toxic, we fail to understand it's their charm that gets them into our good graces. It's their love that gets them into our good graces. It's their, 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 their charisma. And what happens is that we get in and then we fail to understand that this person is bitter. This person is angry. This person is unforgiving. They've got issues that they've never, ever dealt with. So now, that's why I said there is no excuse or valid explanation for abuse, deception, or betrayal ever. And so there's really, we learn to excuse it, but when someone brings evil upon you, evil intent, even if they said that was not my what? Intention. That doesn't mean if they stole your car, but they said, I, did, I, I was just borrowing, I didn't intend to steal it. Does that help you? No. And so there's no excuse for that. And many of us, we begin to look and think that they have, you know, well, their intentions were right. And then we end up listening to their excuses. So now, if we go a little further, and I said, and feeling, and there is no credit for feeling sorry for yourself. The first few times I went through this, 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 this cycle of betrayal, you tend to want to sulk. It's because it's your critical relationship and you need relationships often, and often to be fulfilled, not truly fulfilled, but you want good relationships. If that relationship was broken, I would sulk. I would pout or I tend to be aloof and off to myself. When you were betrayed by your parents or if they were betrayed, by their parents, or if you've been betrayed by people who were your guardians, whatever the case may be that you trusted. As a child, the only recourse you have to do is to pout or to get upset, but you can't go off on your caretaker. And so I said, instead of feeling sorry, you must acknowledge and understand and come to terms with the relationship. And it took me years, and it takes us years of toxic people in our lives before some of us, some of us never come around to it, to acknowledge and understand and come to terms with the relationship, come to understand what I put here. You are at war with your own perceptions now, not with them. They know who they are. They know, they know who they are, and they don't. And so as a person, you have to come to terms with this relationship. You have to begin to understand that their darknesses in Proverbs, they don't know what makes them stumble. Now, coming to, now I'm gonna add something new that you didn't hear before. To acknowledge and understand and come to terms with the relationship, you have to be able to come to the conclusion, I am either dealing with a malignant narcissist, a psychopath, a sociopath, a borderline personality disordered person, a drama queen, and or an emotional vampire. To come to terms with this relationship, you got to acknowledge, I am either dealing with a middle, after, let's say this, after you, no, you don't have to say it, listen, after you've gone through so many ups and downs, left don't mean right, right don't mean left, wet means dry, dry means wet, Potato means potato, tomato means tomato. After you've gone through everything, it's almost like Obama's presidency. He, whatever he can say, the Republicans can say the exact opposite. And even if he say what they said, they still upset because he said it. Well, the Republicans are psychopaths. So, I don't say psychopaths, but they can be sociopaths. And Democrats can be sociopaths and psychopaths because they're both going at each other, but there's nothing being solved. Are y'all with me? So now, malignant narcissists or psychopaths, and a narcissist is someone 
who is completely consumed with themselves. They, the world must revolve around them and every friendship must revolve around them. Every conversation must revolve around them. And if people are not revolving around them, then their world is shattered. All of these people, drama queens, emotional vampires where they, they, they steal your emotions. So if we go further, if a per you have to conclude or come to terms that if a person is willing to lie, falsely accuse, dramatize, smear, cheat, steal, manipulate, accuse, blame, or twist to get what they want, they are a betrayer. And in doing so, they do this with lack of guilt or remorse. They do so with lack of what? Now, remember I said you don't need to know why, but you need to know who you're dealing with. If you understand that the situation that they grew up in, if you understand that if they didn't have rules or the rules, the goal line could possibly move over and over again, if they grew up never knowing right from wrong, or if they grew up around adults who were just totally self-absorbed with their boyfriend, their, their girlfriend, their extramarital affair, their clothes, their thing, whatever it is, if, you, if they grew up in that, then they had to learn not to have guilt or remorse. What did the sociopath have to learn, people? Not to have what? Because to have that would crush you in the house you grew up in. To have that would crush you in the environment. So now, you see the charming part, you see the, the part that attracts you, but what you fail to see that at any moment, they can decide. I don't like the way this is making me feel and cut it off. Because they have made a vow never to feel guilt or remorse because the moment they felt guilt or remorse in whatever situations they were in, the people cranked up the energy. You ever let somebody know that they got to you but decided, I ain't going to let nobody know they got to me no more? Because if they see your weakness, then they exploit it. Am I making sense to anybody? This, hopefully, listen, this is answering what's going on in today's society. Facebook, as much as it can be a help, it's about betrayal. Am I correct? It's about people, you get mad on that thing, and then you just take secrets. I forgot what they call it. They call it something. And there's some term they have with it. And they got revenge porn. You know, people mess around doing tapes of people, and they take and put your, your tape that you did in the privacy of your home, and now, so you think, but listen, that's so crazy. That is so crazy. Talking about this was, for my, this was for my personal collection. Ain't nothing on the cloud personal, all right? Ain't nothing in this interweb, <laughs> they would say, personal. And so then they, they, they'll put out a letter you wrote or whatever the case may be, but this is a culture of betrayal, and people will side with the betrayer. So we end the relationship, or we take them back, or they lure us back. It can happen 10 times. But if we walk away, they become determined to destroy us. There are some relationships that when you walk away from them, the person is, a, if they're a narcissist, a psychopath, or a malignant narcissist. They had to come up with a new term. They used to just have narcissists, but it's a new term, malignant narcissists, in just the last 10 years or so. And this new term is out because they found out that people are getting hurt and then they are hell bent on hurting people back and destroying them. And so they're determined to destroy you and they will do whatever they got to do because they are appalled that you would think that you could live without them. But there's something deeper going on. They need you. Am I making sense, people? All righty. So you're, you're fighting a war within. I'm trying to tell you what even happened with our church. This, this spirit of offense 
once it gets into a church, once it gets into a congregation, it can tear the relationships of that congregation up because nobody's willing to speak about the elephant that's in the room. No one's willing to speak the truth of what's really happening. So now there's a constant war between illusion and reality. Listen, you can be a child in a family, an adult child, and you can have family members who in one moment, reality, it's all lovey-dory, lovey and hunky-dory, and then in another moment, it's cra crazy chaos. And you don't know what to do when you're with these people. So sometimes you just don't go around or you stay quiet. You don't know what to do because at any moment, I just heard somebody today, they was out playing kickball. There was a lady at the airport. They were playing kickball before, you know, somebody fighting in a Mercedes Benz. Inside of them, I guess she had to put the Mercedes Benz. He jumped in the Mercedes Benz and they started fighting. And so it just happens. And so you're in a world where you either believe in love or you're explaining away lies. Now let me go back and can I, I want to slow it down for a sec to tell you, what am I actually saying here, people? I'm trying to tell you that when you deal with somebody who will betray you or you deal with somebody who takes on the spirit of offense, they have to keep an illusion painted and you have to live in an illusion for the relationship to be healthy, even if it's unhealthy. And so I said there was a process in this thing of betrayal. They validate you, and then they betray you that first time, and then after they validate you, they it's a re-seduction because they re-seduce you, and then it's more betrayal, and then they reframe the situation, and they tell the story in a different way as if it didn't happen the way that it actually happened, and before long, you feel crazy. And it's not until you have a life crisis. It's not until you have reached your end. It got to a point that I, I, I started getting physically ill just to have a conversation with people. I don't know if you've ever felt that before where your stomach will start to hurt or you feel nervous and I got ill or I got physically ill. In fact, when I was writing this message on Wednesday, sweat started rolling down my armpits and I wasn't hot, but it was so close to me. Are y'all following me? It was so real as I was typing it, my body was really experiencing what it is that I was trying, what I was trying to convey. So when you have a life crisis, you get exhausted and you say, and you end up saying, I can't do this anymore. But the moment you say, I can't do this anymore, that bond still remains. So today we now want to put the bookend on this. When you say, I can't do this anymore, what is really, hap what is really happening is that you have been seduced or pulled back into a relationship with somebody several times and it ends up having problems again. Not just problems, but severe non-negotiable problems. So what I wrote was, the big mistake is we prefer the story over the facts, the behavior and the results. So what ends up happening, we prefer them to tell us this long story. I can't wait to hear what they're gonna say now. When I, and we're sitting there trying to listen to a person and it's going to make sense, and I'll just say this. Let me just get to it right now. Their whole world is one where they refuse to take responsibility. And so when you, re when you prefer the story, you find yourself sitting listening for lies. I wish somebody understood what I was talking about here. You find yourself scanning the conversation for loopholes. You find yourself listening to what they say and then driving later on and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. If somebody else you know, no, you pick the phone up and you call them. Hey, do you remember when they said such and such and such and such? Yeah, well, that can't be true because when they said this, this was happening. 
Have you ever had somebody tell you, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing this for? Then do it. Then you bring it back to them and you say, you did this and you said this is why you're doing it. And they say, no, I didn't. And that's when you're sitting there and you're saying, oh, my God. That's why your voice gets high. What? What are you saying? So if you, if, if, in, in the early stages of betrayal, so I'm just crazy, right? All right, I'm just, it, it, it just must be me. And then you look at them, and I don't know if you've ever dealt with somebody who is a professional liar. And so you look at them, and sometimes you, like I had this one sister whose husband kept going out on crack binges. And then he would come back. And then he would tell her, keep the money. Don't let me. It's like Bride of Frankenstein. No matter what I say, do not open this door when he goes in with Frankenstein. No matter what I say, don't open this door. And he closes the door to lock him in with Frankenstein. And then what happens? Let me out! They start screaming. Well, he told her, well, no matter what I say, do not give me the money. So did she decide that that's what she's going to do? So the next thing is a physical fight. So he's choking her out for the ATM card. I say to myself, oh, I know it's over now. It's done. I know it's over. They right back together again. So when she talks to him, she says, he was so sincere this time. It, it was, we connected this time. I wonder if it's as quiet in Maryland as it is in Atlanta. She preferred the what? Story. When you prefer the story over the Facts, you set yourself up for la la land. Now, when we prefer the story over the facts, we under, we don't understand that their charm, their company, their romance, their charisma, our connection to them replaces God. Replaces re, replaces God. My soul thirsts for them and not Him. So I found myself, Lisa. I had very close, some very close relationships, and I found myself torn between my heart desiring God and my heart desiring a relationship with the person. I don't know if you've ever been there. And God was challenging me to say, you see the reality of what's happening here. You're trying to whitewash it or sweep it under, but this person has shown you repeatedly this is who I am. This is why Maya Angelou says when the person introduces you, believe who they are the first time. That, that really, that has weight. So now, why do they make you feel crazy? Because their goal is to evade accountability. I hope that the Lord is helping you to see today. I ask, I said, God, why would I do this? Because many of us can't live our lives because our lives are filled up with people who are living their lives for them. Does that make sense? Our life is filled up with the energy of somebody else's faults, somebody else's thoughts, somebody else's will, as opposed to what is God leading us as a group, leading us as a church, us as an individual. And so what happens is, you enable them because they evade accountability. And how do they evade accountability, my friends? By avoiding the truth about everything. Denial 24-7 makes them insane and drives you crazy. Why? They're trying to bend your personal narrative to support their delusions. And so when you get in a betrayal bond, where you are now bonded with your betrayer, you can see the truth for what it is and you can feel the truth for what it is. 
You can hear the story for what it is and you can see through it, but you are so bonded by it that the betrayer can now trick your mind into bending your narrative to fit their delusional stories, their lies. And before long, you begin to think, maybe I have a problem. See, what I'm thinking about, what I'm talking about is that daughter who has a mother who is just so dominating, who has been, or has a parent, or somebody has somebody who is just so dominating that they can't have one opinion to their own, to themselves. And what this has done for many of us, and I would surmise why it's really quiet right now, because many of us have spent the rest of our life trying to undo this energy. So when I tell you, circumstantially, things don't look like they're on the up and up. Spiritually, intellectually, mentally, things are on the up and up. Why? Because I have gone through and I have decided I will not allow toxicity in my space. Family no family. Are y'all with me? You're a friend when you show yourself friendly. You're an enemy when you say you're a friend, but you show yourself an enemy. Jesus said, who is with me? He says, but those who do the will of God. So now they have teapot temper tantrums. See, I guess what I'm trying to tell you, because you can be married to somebody who's a sociopath. That's perfect. Who's a sociopath. They, you love them. They have great, they have, they, they, see, some think of sociopaths as these people who, don't worry about it, the people who got uh, stabbing people. They got you thinking about, what's that guy? It's an old movie. Dude in the shower. I can't think of his name. Psycho and Jason. And where would Jack Nicholson play something? I forget. Shining and whatever these late. I don't even look at these other scary movies. They too high tech. I looked at one scary movie. I said, I'll never look at another one again. I jumped so many times. I said, Jill, I'm about to cut circulation off in your leg. It was just, it, it just kept happening. I, and it was, they got, they got, got some, I guess they got it computerized. They can make you jump and you didn't even know that you was jumping. So I just, I ain't looking at no more horror movies. But psychopaths or sociopaths are not killers necessarily. They're just not fillers. They don't feel. So if you are in relationship with a sociopath, it's like a tea party, temper tantrum. You go in, little girl's playing with the tea, but it's water. And you tell her that it's water, she goes off. It's tea, this is tea. And you say, no, it's water. No, this is tea. And you do everything and say, no, this, that is tea, it's tea, it's tea, it's tea. But it's okay, it's tea. It's tea. That's what the betrayer does. That's what the sociopath does. They go off to get you to line up what they will. Even if they wrong, they, they, don't, they don't even want, listen, they don't even want you to even think that they're wrong. So their whole world, their whole world is one where they refuse to take responsibility. So this, I like this picture here. There's a, a hand coming out of the mouth of the man, and it's grabbing her face. Meaning his words are so abusive. His words are so attacking. Their words are so critical. It kills your soul. So now, when I say take responsibility, when you have betrayed or you have allowed yourself, let me, let me make sure I'm in the right company with people. How many of you realize I can now look in my life and I can see toxic people I allowed in my space and the damage they caused? Raise your hand. Right. I can see you in Maryland. Once you come to an understanding how toxic a relationship is, I want you to, un let's, let, no, let's not go to the spirit realm. God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. God says, I want to bless you. God says, I want to do abundantly more than you, that you could ever think or imagine. 
he's not lying. But I found that I was limiting my blessings by staying connected to toxic people. I won't even be around people who are vain. If somebody's got a look at me situation, if somebody got a, and they, they got vanity as their problem, I spend time away from them. Why? Because I don't need it in my space. See, some of us, we want to lose weight for vanity's sake. We want to be in shape for vanity's sake. And we can tell ourselves it's health-wise, but you got to be careful. It's like that story called Christie. This Christie had the stomach surgery, lost all the weight. And once she lost the weight, she became addicted to other things because she never dealt with what she had not dealt with. In my own personal life, I had to make a decision to say I cannot be connected, connected to toxic stuff because it hinders my creativity. Say this, I need creativity to survive this world. When I allow toxic people to dirty my energy, they hinder my creativity. Thus, if God has plans for my life, I thwart God's plans by connecting to them. Using my energy, come on, to try to help them. Are y'all listening? So I look up, listen, if you get betrayed good enough, If anybody gets betrayed good enough, it'll destroy your life. If, so, if anybody has ever had somebody out to destroy you, has anybody ever had somebody out to destroy you? Raise your hand. Okay, I want to make sure I got the right people. And you're trying to figure out, and you try to leave them alone, and they still out to destroy you. You will understand God is using it. All the betrayals was for me to finally turn to him and stop making my relationship or making my relationship with people key in my life. So now, I'm going to take you to a diagram. It's the drama triangle. It's called the drama triangle. You have the victim, the victimizer, and the rescuer. The victim has the role, their job is to be victimized. The victimizer is the persecutor. The persecutor role is to victimize the victim. Then you have the rescuer. The rescuer job is to rescue who? The victim. The rescuer goes to rescue the victim. And how does the rescue rector, why does the rescuer rescue the victim? Many of us are connected to toxic people and toxic situations because we are rescuers. The rescuer understands what it means to be victimized, and so the rescuer goes in to try to speak truth to the victim. But it took me a while to get this and understand the victim needs the victimizer. The victim needs the persecutor. Are y'all listening to me? And why does the victim need to persecute? Because the persecutor has what the victim wants. Say this, the victim didn't want to be rescued. They just wanted the victimizer to act right. So you as the rescuer thinking you're going to come in and give the victim a, some truth about the victimizer so they would see this person in a clearer light so that they could feel better about themselves and you could help set them free, the victim becomes the victimizer, the persecutor, and they turn on a rescuer and you become the victim. Here's a prime example. Police officers are told never break up a marital dispute between a couple. Why? Because if you go grab the man, who gonna jump on the police? If you go grab the wife, who's going to jump on the police? The man. And so 
And before long, now you're going to be fighting for your life. It took me forever to realize that the victim so needs the victimizer that when you come and tell the victim a truth about what is happening to their situation, they get upset with you because the victimizer, the psychopath, the sociopath, the drama queen, the emotional vampire, the stalker, the whatever other stuff I name, they are the drug to the victim. So I stay connected to people who, who hurt me because I was addicted to that energy. I hope that I've submitted to you this morning that if you are addicted to the energy of negativity and addicted, and I, what I want to tell you is when some people say, but I can't seem to get them out of my mind. If you've been in a relationship for quite some time, what happens is your brain rewires. That intensity, ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs, make up to break up, to make up, to break up, to connect, to get back together, to be separated, to be divorced, to be get back together, and you're going back and forth. That, that back and forth is so intense between you and the victim and the victimizer, it creates an insane bond. And when you are now bonded to the victimizer, the, you, the victim now turns on. Let's say, friends, I go in and try to tell somebody the truth, tell the victim the truth. The victim will turn on me in hopes that the persecutor slash victimizer will see their loyalty to them and then give them what they need because they still have loyalty to them. Now, y'all listen to me. is sickening. So what should you do? Mind your business. Hello? Say this, I cannot teach what God can teach. I cannot show a person only what God can show them. You don't help a victim until a victim comes and says what? Help! You know how I got into so many problems? I'm helping people that ain't asked me for no help. I'm trying to rescue people that ain't even want to be rescued. I'm thinking once they see the truth about what's going on, they'll straighten up. But before long, now you got five people disliking you. And then the victimizer uses what the victim, because it, 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 without fail, you go to rescue the person who's going through, the persecutor slash victimizer will now turn up what the victim needs. This way they become nicer. So the victim says, no matter what the rescuer is saying, I just love the man. I don't care what you say. When I want to be needed, when I need to be needed, when it comes to loving me, he's all right. When it comes to providing me, he's all right, all right. He's my inspiration. And no one can understand our relation. So when I'm down, he's the one. He makes me feel real good inside. He makes me feel joyous. He makes me feel all so right. Y'all should be laughing at this, man. This, this is somewhat amusing. But some, let's see, one sister in, in Maryland talking about, hey, this, 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 is, this is ridiculous. I can't laugh. <laughs> Here you can laugh. You better say this. It's not real. Say this. It's not real. Do me a favor. Everybody do me one favor. I'm going to finish, but everybody smile just so I can have that mental image in my mind. Marilyn, everybody show me your teeth just for a second. Show me your teeth. Come on, Kiana. There's a sister behind Kiana. She done been crossed up the whole time. Just, I, I, just, just hold on, sister. I got you. I got you. So now, you have to make a decision that I'm going to live my life. 
once your life has been destroyed by betrayal, you have to acknowledge, God, I have, as a victim, I have not allowed you to fulfill what only you could fulfill. One time somebody asked me, and why won't you separate yourself from them? And I didn't want to answer. I didn't want to answer because I thought I needed them. Sometimes we feel we need people because people fulfilled our self-esteem. But unless God can fulfill that with love, then you're going to always need somebody. And so now, I had to, and if you have been someone who has been betrayed, you have to say, it has happened. It is over. They did what they did, and you can go with that adage, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. You now have to make a decision to say, I am no longer going to allow a human to do in my soul only what God can. The aftermath of being betrayed turns your, it, it'll, it'll, it'll kill your ministry, it'll kill your business, It'll destroy your project. It'll destroy your confidence. It'll destroy everything you've got. But the blessing we have in this is God says, I know you are mine. His eye is on the sparrow. And he says, I'm watching you. And he says to me, and he had to say to me, surrender to me surrender to me and it took as you said watching this sister go through cancer it took all these trips to the hospital all these different procedures for me to finally realize you got one life to live those who love you love you those who betray you betray you the only way a sociopath changes is that they have an encounter with God but you cannot be their encounter let's say for instance but I have to be connected to I'm at the crux of how to deal with somebody that you got to be connected to. I just put on the slide. I'm trying to remember it, but I'll just say it. I have it memory. There you go. It's not, say this, it's not my problem. I didn't create it. I didn't cause it. I can't cure it. I can't control it. Get off their back, get, get out of God's way, get on with your life. Say this, just understand this. Whatever abandonment that they're going through, say, I didn't create that. Whatever makes them feel defensive, or their inability to talk around you, or their inability to talk to you, you ain't known them long enough to have that kind of effect. Say, I didn't cause that. If they have a life where they have refused to accept responsibility 24-7 to keep the illusion of their denial going, say, I can't cure that. Say, if they'll do it to their family, they'll do it to me. I can't control that. I had this brother who betrayed his daughter by walking out on her and not being there for her. And I said, if he can do this to his daughter, I've got nothing coming. If he can't be connected to someone who his flesh and blood, I have nothing coming. Get off of his back. What does that mean? Stop talking about it. Stop trying to get them to understand. Get off of their back. Get out of God's way. 
What does it mean to get out of God's way? Get on to fulfilling what God has for you and living your life. Do not allow yourself to take on a spirit of offense, offense and be bitter, but let God's love flow in you. And then get on with your life. Say there, say if do do me a favor, hold your breath. Let it go. How many of y'all had air to let out? What does that mean? That means God still got something for you to do. So here I am. I am finally through my betrayals. I've learned from them. I'm still learning some other things. And let me just give this to you. Once your life has been destroyed, don't try to rebuild the life that you had. Don't try to rebuild and recapture what you had. Learn from me. Try to pick up where God wants you to be. And then watch him do what he has to do. Give it to you, Tony and Karen. After going through these betrayals at some point, it got to a point, after going through these betrayals, it got to a point. I said, I... I don't know if I can handle another person saying, I got a problem and this is happening and that is happening. And God said, as long as you say that, then it's going to keep happening. He said, but the day you can come to the conclusion, I don't care anymore to care. And I'm allow God to be who he is. Then he can come through. He turned my life around. He turned me around. This is a a way to deal with people who, when you've been betrayed, this is how you get your life back in order. Say the great rock. Say the great rock. You have to make yourself like a great rock. You have to re decrease yourself and let God increase. There's nothing fancy about this rock, if you just, just walking and saw this rock in the street, you wouldn't even look down at it. It's just a rock. People who abuse you, people who betray you, they need your energy. If you give them excitement, if you give them that, they're going to take it. But if you become boring, say boring, if you stop letting them know what you're interested in because they're going to go whatever you love, after whatever you love. For me, it was my reputation. They're going to go whatever, whatever you love. When they do it, if you become like this rock, and I just throw it down there on the ground, if you become like this rock, after a while, they'll get bored. A vampire won't come to somebody who don't have no blood. Amen? What does a betrayer person want for you, from you? An occasion. They want a moment so they can get you told. But if you decide, let's say for instance you got a child by a sociopath. Stop getting, stop letting them see you get all upset over the same thing over and over again. Let it becomes almost a game. Let them start throwing all the stuff to try to hook you in and just respond like this. Okay. All right. Okay. And another thing. Blah, 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 blah. I'll take care of that. Is that it? Oh, so you ain't going to say nothing. So would you like me to say Oh, so, so now you're going to use reverse psychology. I got ready to say, I'm not using reverse psychology. You don't say nothing. Speak to a fool according to his folly. Or don't speak to a fool according to his folly. And then one day you will look up. To them, they will move on to somebody else. And you'll get your life back. And so I've had to, I guess I'm trying to end it, but and I don't know, I got to catch my guess of playing everything. But I've decided. I'm going on. 
and I'm prepared to go it alone. But I'm going what? On. 